Discord. All right. So it looks like I'm first. Oh, yeah. And here's one that I found very interesting. So this is OpenWRT, which is, um, as far as I can tell, mostly used you know, in routers, although they say some people use it on other things. And I thought this was very nice, a very interesting bug. Um, so they use HTTP to load the software packages. On OpenWRT, you can open a graphical page and you can pick um, extra packages to install. And I know this because when I was trying to do IP version six years ago, we tried to update an OpenWRT to IP version six and we learned the hard way that if you have a cheap Linksys router, you can put on about four packages before everything starts crashing. But anyway, you can put all kinds of software on it and it loads the entries over HTTP. So you could in principle modify it. But even if you don't, it's still vulnerable because when it loads packages, the integrity control is implemented by this SHA-256 sum. So theoretically, it'll download a package and then it will check the SHA-256. But in fact, it never does. And I thought this is a fun bug. And he had one here saying, the actual bug is here. Can you see it? And I actually saw it, which is not that common for me. I'm not that much of a source code auditor. But the thing I see here is it's trying to read that SHA-256 um, string and it checks to see if it has a space. If there's a space, it skips the space. But then later on, it just uses the previous pointer as if the space is still there. And the configuration file always puts a space before the start of it. So this routine, which is intended to remove the space, in fact, makes sure that the SHA-256 sum always starts with a space. And that makes it invalid. So the other routine that compares it always decides it's invalid and doesn't do the comparison and fails open. So you can load any junk with the wrong SHA-256 and it will totally accept it as long as it has the right length. So all you have to do is take some malware, pad it with zeros to be the right length, completely ignore the fact that SHA-256 doesn't match. And then when someone loads that file, it will, um, it will execute it. So I thought that's great fun. Of course, it's not a huge vulnerability because you'd have to do a man in the middle attack or poison DNS. So you can't just do it to everybody on the web, but it's nice to see one where you can understand the source code. So I like that one. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I always look for the easy ones so my <laughs> students can do them. You know, I don't do anything hard. Everything I write will hopefully turn into like a one hour project. Yeah. So here's stuff about Zoom and I added another one here. Yeah. Zoom hot topic, you know, hot topic of the day since oh, yeah. uh, their uh, user base has skyrocketed over um, the last a uh, couple weeks yep. um, but this one I thought this was a good uh, article for two reasons first of all it talks about uh, zoom bombing which is is the new hot troll prank um, that everybody's uh, worried about now because uh, you know there are a lot of people with uh, idle idle time and um, they want to like disrupt stuff so uh, it's actually been quite a problem for colleges the last couple of days um people uh you know basically uh taking over the zoom call and saying offensive and nasty things so um this is actually just a good uh a good reminder of how to secure your zoom calls um there's you know four main points in there that a lot of people actually don't know about so uh and and some of them that i know about and don't do so uh, I thought it was a pretty good little tip sheet for folks to know about. Well, I live on Zoom, and I think I'm breaking all these rules, just like every other rule. Uh, yep. I mean, but I think the, you know, the Zoom bombing I hear about is where someone jumps in and then shares their screen. And I don't think you can do it while I'm sharing my screen. Uh, it's not. I don't think it's just that. Uh, people um, jump into the meetings um, because a lot of the times, like, I don't, and you don't, uh, for our classes, we don't, re um, we don't uh, require people to register. Right. Um, so the links will get out there, especially for some of the bigger classes, and people just uh, grab a link, jump into the chat, and start screaming um, offensive things. During or they those. just pick random numbers. Yeah. But, but you can yeah. mute people, and you can shut down their video easily. And so then the only thing they could do is scream in the chat and I can just take, that doesn't get recorded anyway. I don't know. I'm really not too afraid of it. I think the big issue here is K through 12, where if someone actually blasted pornography for five seconds, it would be the end of the world and you would get fired. Right. But my class is full of adults and they're analyzing malware and stuff. They're hopefully relatively prepared to see a little bit of nasty stuff without freaking out. 
Right. But I think that for some people in some schools, it's an issue. So. Yeah, I think it is. But I, I, I tend to agree with, um, I think, Dave, ah, so there's a chat message coming in yeah. from Caitlin. Ah, yes, yeah, saying something about John Madden. I don't know what that is, but anyway. Uh, She's spamming the chat. <laughs> yep. She's apparently trying to spam the chat with something, but as usual, I'm so clueless, I don't even know why that would be offensive. But anyway, uh, so... <laughs> uh, I, I've now totally become the guy. I remember when I was in grad school, somebody brought in... The Star Wars movie came out. Someone brought in a plastic lightsaber, and they showed it to the boss, and he said, what is that? Some kind of new optical device? He'd never had no... I'm totally that guy now. Like... Yeah. Kirk talks to me about TV shows, and I, I say, you know, I threw away my TV 20 years ago. I know nothing. I couldn't possibly care less. You know, anyway. Um, anyway, I thought it's fun. Zoom is supposedly trying to fix their privacy and security issues, which I think have been greatly overblown. Everyone's freaking out and saying, don't use Zoom, when I think it's fine. It's as good as it gets. You know, when I was a junior security researcher, I used to freak out over every little thing, and then I kind of got, to, got a clue, you know. Well, you know, some of the suggestions about what to use instead are pretty bad, too. Uh, yeah. We were, well, a certain person recommended to us to don't use Zoom, use Microsoft Teams. And there are some problems there, too, as you might imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing's perfect. And uh, Zoom seems to be quite responsible about the main thing they did, which I, if I was running a company, I would say the same thing. The number one thing is to ramp up the servers. You can handle the vast amount of traffic and that they have done. And I see everything else can wait till later. And now they've decided to have a 90 day feature freeze to fix all the security issues. I, they really seem like a wise company to me. They're doing the right thing. Yeah. I would have made the same decision. The number one aspect of security that matters is availability. Anyway. Um, yeah, I would so, agree. Yeah. So anyway, then so Google is donating Chromebooks. This is a huge issue. I got students who don't have a good internet connection and who don't have a machine at home, and they're kind of hosed right now. Yeah. So Google has uh, worked with our governor to get four thousand Chromebooks to the hands of K through twelve students. Uh, the the how that's going to happen hasn't been figured out just yet. Yeah. Uh, each all the superintendents in our state are working with the governor to figure that out. But just, just that announcement of 4,000 Chromebooks being donated plus a Wi-Fi access. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's huge for our students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, know, I'm glad to find college buys where you can get $20 per month Wi-Fi yeah. hotspot um, yeah. for our students. So that will help. You know, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical of this whole thing than, than most people. I remember back in the, I'm going to date myself, back in the 90s. Uh, Apple was really big about putting computers in the classroom and weren't they so nice to do that? Uh, but the whole thing was a marketing ploy. You know, they knew that if they got the kids hooked on Apple computers young, they would buy them as adults. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty, I mean, it's not I, like it's a bad thing. It goes without it's saying. America. That's capitalism. Yeah. That's okay. That goes without saying to, hey, here's a Chromebook. Hey, look, you're using a Chromebook. So buy the next Chromebook. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, Join the, the Google uh, ecology, like join us. Yeah. 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 It, 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 I, I just, I mean, I, I understand where they're coming from and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that I just don't see it as, as Google being magnanimous. Right. right. Oh they're, yeah. yeah. They're just doing business. Well, yeah. yeah. And just like Zoom, I think this is Google being a good company, logically doing things that will promote their brand and increase their uh, share price and benefit the world. That's if you do run a company correctly, it should be a win-win where you help everybody. You know, I don't, I'm a, I'm a filthy capitalist. I'd like to see companies make a pile of money by doing something good. Depends yeah. on the company. I think this is better than uh, what, what happens with uh, a lot of schools where, like, say, Pepsi puts a vending machine uh, in the school to get the kids hooked on Pepsi so they buy it when they're uh, older, you know? Yeah, I think that's a lot more problematic. Yeah, but yeah, same. I don't, I don't think I, I, I agree with you, Caitlin. It's the same strategy. Upset that they got used to using a Chromebook. I don't think that's harming them. <laughs> right. I will say one thing. My uh, my nephews know how to use Linux commands thanks to the fact that they were given Chromebooks in oh, school. So, so. I would bet that someone is convinced showing them how to hack the Chromebook. Yeah, somehow they knew all these commands about. Um, running system resources and running eternal blue. I don't know where they got that from. I have no idea. Cool. 
Eternal Blue on a Chromebook? Only to well, on Windows from from a Chromebook onto Windows. Oh gotcha. well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't I don't know where they get it. It's some somebody's a bad influence, clearly. Evidently. So uh, let's see about this internal service desk exposed. Ah uh, yes. So. In order to combat uh, the work at home uh, epidemic that's going on right now, um, instead of setting up nice VPNs and making sure that the, your employees can get to their resources securely, uh, IT professionals have basically said, you know what, this is too hard. Let's just expose our entire internal service desks to the internet. That way anyone can reach them, including our employees working from home. And Awesome. There are repercussions to this. Um, no way. <laughs> yeah, I know you wouldn't think so, but there are. Um, <laughs> and so now you can like log on to a bunch of companies like internal like Jira and ticketing software stuff and put in your own tickets for things like, um, I don't know, McDonald's needing to, to bring back Szechuan sauce or whatever goofy things people might do. McDonald's had Szechuan sauce? Yeah, there was a famous thing with like the Rick and Morty fans. Yeah. They, oh. they wanted like the Szechuan sauce and they wanted to bring it back. It was, it was kind what of cringy. Long lines that. for that. Yeah, wow. it, it was pretty cringy, but. Uh, if there was anything good at McDonald's, I missed that news story. I mean, anyway. <laughs> um, well, this is great. Yeah, that sounds like great fun. Yeah, you can just check out what they're using internally. Yeah, you know, even, if, even if you're just curious, even if you're not up to you know, malicious deeds, you can still check out how these co uh, companies operate internally, what kind of software they use, you know, how they do two factor auth, that kind of stuff, all exposed now to the internet for everyone to see. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's very nice. All right. And then we're back to, oh, Mongo. Yeah, this, this is something, you know, I used to be a database administrator and I'm kind of happy to see this becoming popular. So um, if you're the database administrator, then you have the ability to move databases and copy them and back them up and query them to answer questions. But of course, there might be data in there that's really none of your business. And there've been a lot of exposures like this, like uh, employees at hospitals looking up the medical problems of celebrities to expose them. So they're now putting in field level encryption, which I'm glad to see, especially in a very insecure product like Mongo. So that now, uh, instead of seeing a data like this, where you'll see somebody's name and their social security number and their phone number, you'll see this, you can still see their name and you can still mess with the records, but the PII is encrypted. So even the administrator can't see it and only people who are authorized can decrypt those fields. And this I'm glad to see, I think it's a, it's a good step forward. At RSA, I actually met with one of the companies that was doing that specifically, because it, it was really interesting. And I did like that they were doing that. And it seems like a, a no duh sort of move for database uh, designers, but uh, apparently it's just becoming a thing now. Yeah, well, I, I think behind the scenes, this is quite technically difficult. And I would bet, I would be quite concerned about actually getting locked out of your data. So I'd want to make sure uh, there are backups of the keys or something somewhere. But it does seem like a good move. The, the next step is in Veil, which I hear advertising, which is like black magic, where you encrypt it and you use it, and you never decrypt it at all. That's homomorphic encryption, which is sort of science fiction and just beginning to be real. But this is the old fashioned encryption where you have to have somebody that has the key that can decrypt it and use it. Anyway, I thought better than nothing, which was uh, what was what they had before. What's that? It's better than nothing. Yeah, uh, it's much better than nothing, especially for things that get leaked on the database for SQL injection and stuff. It right. would be cool if it was actually encrypted. Right. All right, and so now we got this Finks banking trojan. Yeah, so I thought this was kind of interesting uh, just because it's uh, a, a resurgence of something that was popular uh, a few years back. And essentially, um, threat actors are, uh, are emailing people dirty uh, Microsoft files uh, again because it's so damn effective. And um, basically, it's dirty dills uh, attached to these... Um, the macros in these uh, Microsoft Word files that are, are atta now attached to uh, emails about government relief for the coronavirus. So I can see how it's effective because people are getting desperate. Um, it's and not like this one's not even Dills, it's just VB script. Well, it, it's, I, it says something in the. Oh, there's a malicious Dill too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. 
using just something, w script something, yeah. that folks, something that folks should know about uh yeah this is zeus boy zeus is open source for a long time yeah all right and uh so cybersecurity workers are essential well yeah news. i thought we were a long time ago but the cisa put up a, a actually the cisa put up a, a uh, letter on the 19th of march about about this and it's like finally getting out there of hey there's kind of duh that we're essential yeah yeah you know i have a huge essential thing phil's coffee is open again <gasps> so my, my life is greatly improved anyway you can't you can't hang out in there though can you Nope, but you can go there and get it, <laughs> which I still regard as an essential service. Yes. All right, and uh, Caitlin has SSH. Yes. So if you are like me, uh, when you set up an SSH server, what yep. you do is you type, you know, system control, start SSHD, um, and then log in with your password. And if you're really clever, you put in your, your RSA public key and, and you know, authorized keys. Yeah. And then you don't even have to type your password and you're totally secure and that's great. And SSH is amazing. Well, it turns out there's a lot more you can do with SSH to make it much more secure. Um, you can do things like create a host certificate and then sign the RSA keys with the host certificate so that you would have like different RSA keys depending on the server. Um, you can, Oh yeah, you can, uh, uh, oh, let's see what else can you do. You can. There, there uh, was there was a, a, a an article a few weeks ago where someone showed that every time you connect with SSH, it tries all your keys in series, so you can just yes. harvest them. So exactly. this would prevent that, I guess. It that would, would that would prevent it. Okay. You you can do two factor auth. You can set it up with Google. You can. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of things you can do here to um. If you're looking for a good quick article about how you can secure your SSH which is something that gives me a lot of anxiety because I know I have an SSH server to my home that I use a lot. Um, and I'm, I, I do what I can, uh, but I'm definitely going to implement all these recommendations to, you know, secure it a bit because if someone gets access to SSH, it, it's over. They have the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. So you could also limit by IP address, but that seems pretty useless these days because your IP address keeps changing. What I do, well, I have fail to ban, which I find to be more effective than IP yeah. limiting. Um, I, I do notice there's a lot of people, a lot of bots on the internet that try to log in as root or that kind of stuff onto SSH servers. Mm -hmm. And it is nice not to waste my bandwidth that after two unsuccessful tries, just get them, just knock them out. Yeah, I think that's great. And how long are they knocked out for? Forever or half an hour? No. I'm, I assume I'm going to lock myself out. So just like an hour. That makes, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. I like that. Uh, might make a good project. And then this I thought was bloody awesome. Um, almost all important large scale hardware is just appalling because it's from long ago. So Wind River writes all the stuff used in airplanes and it just has a bunch of terrifying defects that they've just gotten used to. Like it uses uh th something like 24 bit code to record things. So every 51 days you have to reboot the airplane and someone was probably, you know, by Boeing missiles, you have to reboot them every 20 hours or the counters run out. And um, otherwise, if you don't, it starts mixing old data with new data in the panel displays and in the black box. And there was a crack with the black box was because uh, it had like old data, which was marked as new data. Cause I guess the clock rolls up. And you can't tell the old data from the new data. So I thought that's pretty awesome. This is also the plane that uh, they land with a ta using a tablet. Right. And the one where they put in a software fix for the geometrical changes for the new version of the airplane, which caused it to crash. <laughs> so is that your dog, Liz? Uh, yeah, in the background. Yeah, you should let us see your dog sometime. Anyway, I've, I've, I've seen articles where they say the best part of Zoom calls is when somebody's cat or dog comes in or their kid. Uh-huh. Oh, you've seen them before. Usually they're uh, wrestling in the background, so it looks like I have a dog fighting ring or something. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, especially in this time, you have to have something to keep yourself amused at home. Anyway. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the first lady said, um, get a, you know, get a hobby. 
Yeah. Or did she? You yeah. know, I haven't heard much from the first lady. Get a hobby. Wow. Well, uh, this is this like let the meat cake. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, the last two that I have today are on uh, measures that uh, governments oh, yeah. are taking to prevent um, coronavirus infection. You know, here oh, yeah. in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're getting salty because they had to close down all the parks because people won't stay six feet apart and practice social distancing in the park, but. A um, couple other countries are getting a little more drastic about it. So this first article is talking about how um, basically Australia, if you have it and you won't stay in, they're going to put tracking devices on you. Ba essentially, like what we do when somebody's under house arrest or work release um, and you get an ankle bracelet or whatever, and if you leave your house, you get the cops will like chase you back in, and uh, you know they'll have escalating levels of enforcement on that. You know, we don't see this is, age. What people will do is they will refuse to take the test, so they yeah. don't get marked as a pariah. Well, and then yeah, like just uh, this last week, I, there was a guy in uh, Rochester, New York, um, where he lied about his symptoms so that he could be in the delivery room with his wife at the yeah. hospital and uh with predictable catastrophic results yep i thought we've been through this enough times but apparently not and, but, this is, and do uh, charity, you can always kind of do charity to do something yeah. else. At least what Australia is doing not, is not quite as drastic as Duterte. So uh, his latest his latest stunt is uh, if you're out of your house and you're giving us any kind of trouble, um, then the cops can just shoot you dead in the street. Now, I thought that was sort of blanket policy uh, for um, the citizens over there. Uh, but he's really, uh, he, he really decided that he needed to put this out here. So... Well, you know, to be fair to Duterte, this is a step in the direction of responsibility. About two years ago, he said, to get rid of the drug dealers, I'm just authorizing any random citizen to kill anybody you think is a drug dealer. It doesn't even have to be the cops. I'm just yeah. legalizing murder. So here it's suggesting that the police and military would do it. So that's a step towards civilization. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to... Uh... I'm going to have to say that both of those are pretty poor uh, po public policy. Well, he's went from an F minus to an F. You know, there's a measure here. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in those countries. Yeah. yeah. I think the best improvement would be not shooting your citizens dead in the street. That might be a little counterproductive to keeping your uh, population survival numbers up. Well, now you're like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez. This is clearly yeah, yeah, socialism yeah. you're suggesting there, I mean. Clear, clearly a communist in our midst. I think so. Anyway, um, so, all right, so this, boy, this reminds me of Linux on the desktop. I've been hearing this. Yep. I'm trying to just say this is ridiculous. So yep. why don't you say that's, And that's why, I, that's why I added it in, because it's, it's, <laughs> this is funny that it's coming back again and again and again. That they're... They're talking, hey, you know, biometrics and and keyboard behavior and that kind of stuff can kill the the password. I don't necessarily think it will kill the password. I yeah. think we're we're stuck with the password for at least another fifty years. Yeah, I think the problem is passwords are the least secure, but they are the cheapest and easiest. So yeah. there's will it always be the bottom level. Yep. 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 Even if it's just the the bottom level of a two or three step process yeah. password i don't think passwords will be going away anytime soon and, but it's just funny to yeah. to read these things and and how they're so hopeful that the things like zero trust and and all these other ways will finally get rid of the scourge of the password yeah passwords are very annoying i mean i was trying to put on the fills app to get my coffee but i couldn't do it because it wanted my apple password because my face recognition doesn't work when i'm outside wearing a mask so <laughs> That's annoying. And I don't yeah. have an Apple password. Apple security is so tough. They keep making me change it and they keep making me make it more complicated. So I always forget it. So anyway. Yeah. One of my friends had to shave off of his beard so that um, a mask would um, sit flush with his face. And he's complaining that it broke all of his uh, face ID and uh, facial recognition. Yeah, I've been thinking of whether I should train my phone to recognize me with a mask on. I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not. 
<laughs> anyway, so now I got an iPhone camera hack. This is an awesome hack, by the way. All right. Uh, so, so the way this hack works is that you go to a web page. The web page takes your picture. The end. And the light doesn't come on or anything? Nope. Nope. The guy who found this bug got $75,000 from Apple. Does wow. it work? Have you tried it? I have not tried it. I do not want to try it. I, think, well, I mean, maybe, I at least not on someone else's site. It updates, doesn't it? Uh, I don't, I have an iPhone 6, so I'm pretty iPhone. sure my browser, I'm pretty sure my iPhone browser is still uh, Mobile successful. Safari? Yeah. Wow, I've got some old iPhones, and I never update my OS. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you go to a web page, and it could be like an ad in a web page, like on the New York Times, and then it just snaps a photo, sends it to the attacker. Is it public? Can we like test this? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Screen recording. You have to probably find. I mean, there's CVEs. I didn't see a yeah. GitHub page though. Yeah, I didn't see the CVE the... list, but there's a yeah. bug PLC. There is. Where's that? Right there, right there. I reported this bug under those under the gray line. A bug POC to give them a live oh to give them a live demo. Yeah. Anyway, right. um, well that boy, I gotta shut one of those up. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very, very cute. Everybody I know doesn't update their iPhone because they just screw everything up and you don't need to. So mm -hmm. this would probably work just fine. Yeah, yeah. Go. And then you have Luddites like me and Caitlin who are still on uh, iPhone sixes. Yeah. I've got a ton of those. Yeah, so anyway, that sounds like fun. And, and I think the most important thing we talked about is, is, what, is what you did with your face, Kate. Oh, yes. Uh, so nor, I don't want to advertise uh, companies, but this is actually, this is a uh, independent small company uh, called, they do a product called Base Rig, <laughs> where you can turn yourself into a sandwich or whatever, and you can hook it up with Zoom pretty That's easily. Awesome. Yeah, it's in, in, the, in the age of, of, of Zooming and, and stuff, this can be nice for people that really want privacy, but still want to be able to video chat or show some emotions. And it does full face tracking. So oh, wow. if I close my eyes, my avatar will close its eyes. If I open my mouth, it opens its mouth. You know, well, left, right, awesome. up, down. Yeah. I think this would greatly make a lot of people happier with their Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are there any more uh, comments to make? Nope, well, that's all I got for today. Yeah. Oh, oh, one more comment. Yeah. I, I want to point people out to a really great movie um, uh, called Spare Part. It was made in 2015, and it's it's about a uh, it's about a team of high school students who join a robotics competition. Okay. Nice. Well, hey. I'm going to stop the recording then. <laughs>